Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show where we talk with accomplished chess players, authors, and personalities about their lives, their careers, and how to improve at chess. Perpetual Chess is brought to you through the generosity of its Patreon and PayPal supporters and by Chessable.com. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Adult Improver edition of Perpetual Chess, where we bring in an accomplished non-chess professional to talk about some of the impressive rating gains they've made. And our guest this week is pretty well known in the online chess community, uh, especially active on Twitter, but also on Facebook, Um, active member of Chess Dojo. Shout out to Chess Dojo, so I know a lot of you guys know him. Uh, He's a 35-year-old dad and cognitive scientist who originally hailed from India. Uh, He's been getting a PhD. He's been in the U.S. for over 10 years and most recently doing postdoc work. Sadly, he'll be leaving us and going back to India, as we'll discuss. Um, Chess-wise, he played as a kid and then really got back into it um, with fervor in uh, 2018. His first USCF established rating was 1675. And one and a half years later, it peaked at 1954, and that was around when COVID hit. I suspect his rating would be even higher. He is um, well known for working very hard on his chest, despite his busy life away from chess. So excited to talk about cognitive science and all his improvement methods and bring him in before he abandons us here in the United States. So uh, Vishnu Srikumar, good to finally have you on the show. Hey, Ben, thank you so much for having me on. It's a great honor to be on your podcast, which is pretty legendary uh, in its own right. Uh, kind of you to say, but I, I'm, but I couldn't be more excited to, um, to hear about your tricks. Um, so we're going to get into all the chess study in pretty short order, but why don't you just give the sort of um, very brief background, Vishnu, of um, your, your childhood. And I should have mentioned, by the way, you're quite an accomplished musician, so you could touch on that a little bit. And then uh, then we'll get to the chess improvement. Okay. Um, yeah, so I was born uh, in the state of Kerala in India, which is a small uh, coastal state. Um, so my hometown is uh, Trishur, which uh, happens to be where Nihal Sarin is also from. Um, So my childhood chess days were spent with some of uh, Nihal's current and former coaches, by the way. Um, But yeah, so I was born in Kerala, but then I moved to uh, Tamil Nadu uh, for a little bit uh, due to my dad's job. So I studied uh, up until third grade in Tamil Nadu and then uh, moved back to Kerala. Uh, At some point, uh, maybe when I was around seven or eight, uh, my dad taught me the moves. And then uh, I started beating him shortly thereafter. And that was the end of my initial uh, chess playing career. Uh, And then I had to wait for my summer vacations um, when I would go back to Kerala and meet my uh, uncles who were much better chess players. And so I had to wait uh, until I could do that to play some chess. Um, Yeah, so, so I did my schooling in Kerala. And then later on, I developed an interest in physics and then went on to do my undergrad and master's in physics from uh, the Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, which is in the northern part of India. So it was a uh, you know, big trip for me, uh, first time away from home. Um, so I went to IIT, uh, did five years of physics, and then my interests uh, slowly changed. Um, I wanted to try and do music cognition to try and understand how human beings perceived and understood music. So I uh, emailed uh, professors here in the U.S., some of whom gave me the advice to go get a more traditional psychology degree, which is how I ended up shifting from physics to psychology. So I ended up doing a Ph.D. in psychology, cognitive psychology, uh, and then moved to the NIH here in Bethesda, Maryland, to do my postdoctoral work um, doing electrophysiology of human uh, memory. Uh, so that's, that's a brief uh, description of my journey so far. Excellent. Yeah. And and uh, listeners may recommend, I mean, uh, may recognize Vishnu's name, like when we interviewed um, cognitive scientist and friend of the show, Christopher Shabri. Uh, Vishnu had a few questions in, uh, related to chess learning. And I know Vishnu has some uh, well-informed opinions of his own that we'll be discussing. So I'm eager to tie your interests together, Vishnu. 
But first, let's let's dig deeper into the the chess bug. So 2018, you're getting your postdoc in Maryland, and suddenly your your interest in chess is uh, rekindled. So what what happened? What brought that about? Um, I was playing chess online, but nothing serious, just like everybody does it, just casual playing. Uh, but uh, around that time, we moved uh, to the current location, which is in Rockville, Maryland. And I came across uh, this posting uh, about a chess tournament, which uh, I think was the Chesapeake Open. And I hadn't played any serious tournaments in the U.S. before then. And when I saw this was a five-minute walk away from where I lived, I wow. decided to go play the tournament. Uh, and I didn't quite know what section to sign up for. Um, I think I emailed the organizer uh, describing to him what my chess playing strength was approximately like. And he recommended under 1700 or something uh, or 1800. I don't remember, uh, but that's what I signed up for. And I ended up getting four out of seven and a check for a hundred bucks. And uh, so that that really made me interested in pursuing, uh, you know, more tournament playing opportunities here in the U.S. So that's how I got started. Cool. And what was your tournament background? So you mentioned playing your dad um, a bit and um, kind of setting it aside for the most part. But how much how much time had you spent actually in over the board competition? So as a child, I played competitively, I would say between the ages of eight or nine to around 13. Um, so the way it works in India is you have these district level tournaments. And if you uh, win first or second at the district level, then you qualify for the state. And then if you t are top two or top three, uh, then you qualify for the nationals. And so I routinely qualified for the state, uh, but there was only one time that I qualified for the nationals from, from the state. Um, okay. But yeah, so these were all age group uh, tournaments, uh, not federated tournaments. So I never really got a rating as a kid, but I would estimate that I probably got to around 14, 1500 strength just by playing as a kid. Okay. And your first result sounds pretty good. I mean, for, I mean, not your first tournament of your life, but first for a long time. I mean, and I know in your interview with uh, Jesse Cry on the Chess Dojo channel, uh, which I definitely recommend listeners check out for more background about Vishnu, um, you estimated that you were probably about 1500 strength when you started studying again. So do you feel like by the time you walked into that tournament, you had already uh, made some strides as an adult? Um, so I never really stopped playing chess in the interim uh, between the time I stopped at the age of 13 and then entered this tournament in 2018. I was playing online and also in college uh, while I was in IIT Kanpur. I also formed the chess club there. Um, so I was organizing some tournaments there. Again, more casual, nothing really serious. But perhaps I, I, I put on some more strength just by playing in the interim. I don't know if I was 1500 or 1600, but it was but somewhere, okay. somewhere around there. Yeah. Yeah. Some, somewhere around there and not having played, um, not having played an OTP tournament for a long time. And this being your first OTP tournament in the U S obviously it's not going to be huge culture shock because you'd been in the country for, uh, around 10 years at that point. But what did it, what did it feel like going back in and, and do you have any advice? I'm sure there's lots of people listening who've gotten to be pretty decent online, mm -hmm. but are thinking of finally playing a tournament when uh, when COVID is over. So yeah. could you describe your feeling re-entering that world and any advice you might impart? Yeah, so I remember being very nervous, um, being the first tournament in a while. Uh, I also remember having this book with me, uh, Zen and the Art of the Motorcycle. So I was reading yeah. this book in between rounds and it helped you know calm myself down. Um, but I also realized, I think around round five, that I was completely exhausted and I was making, you know, mistakes that I thought I would not have otherwise. And so stamina, I realized, was a big uh, part of tournament play in the U.S., which I hadn't experienced before, because we don't really have weekend tournaments in India. Uh, if, you, if you played a full length tournament, it would be across uh, the duration of an entire week, for example. Uh, so the weekend tournament thing was extremely new. So uh, I realized that physical exercise and stamina was a huge part of playing tournaments in the U.S. Um, yeah, so so those were my very first impressions about uh, tournaments in the U.S. Yeah, it can be it can be daunting for sure. I mean, little things like knowing where to go when they post the pairings and stuff. But but listeners, I mean, anyone thinking about it, I definitely it's worth trying. Um, and it, it is a different feeling. It's um. 
It's like a, a heightened version of chess somehow. So you may you may try it and decide you don't like it. Some people find it nerve wracking enough where they just they decide not to do it. Um, other people it just doesn't bother them at all. But definitely worth experimenting because there's a there's a chance that you'll just play better. Um, you'll just have increased focus, like th in the same way. And obviously, there've been studies that. Uh, um, playing chess as a kid can help you with test taking. And it's kind of a similar thing where some people might do better in a competitive atmosphere and others might feel like they're not performing up to the capability, but it's, it's worth investigating um, in any, in any event. Um, so you played that tournament and um, so you had pretty decent results and then Vishnu, what happened? So what are you studying at this point? Like uh, um, at this point, nothing, um, <laughs> but after that first tournament, uh, you know, with this boost in confidence, I went and entered these uh, action tournaments, uh, which I had to drive a little bit for. But then I went there and I soon had this experience that many adult players in the U.S. experience of eight to nine year olds just, you know, pushing their pawns on the king side and checkmating you. Hmm. So I experienced that. And that was incredibly embarrassing. And that's when I decided that I needed to do something to stay competitive. Uh, that's when I started, you know, just looking up stuff online about, you know, chess books. Uh, as a child, I never really read chess books. Nobody ever told me about them. But, you know, once I did my own research, um, uh, I remember telling my friend, my best friend, that it would be great if I could spend four years and get to 2000. And here are some of the books that people seem to be reading uh, in this range. And so I told him about a few books, and he actually gifted me my first two books, uh, which was Silman's Reassess Your Chess and uh, Andy Soltis's uh, Pawn Structure Chess. Good choices. Yeah, so I, I found that those were really helpful uh, because, for example, I didn't even know as black, you know, these breaks of E5 and C5 in the openings that I was playing, right? I didn't even, I, I wasn't even aware of those things. So reading the, that book, Pawn Structure Chess, really helped in that regard. I didn't know of outposts. I didn't know of, you know, looking for squares to put my knights on. So reassess your chess really helped in that regard. Uh, so points that I was leaking really easily, they stopped uh, happening after I read those books. Okay. Yeah. And um, and I want to get more into your your training, Vishnu. I, obviously, there's there's lots more to discuss. But first, we're going to take a break and uh, hear from our friends at Chessable. As always, Perpetual Chess is proud to be brought to you in part by Chessable.com. Chessable is a chess learning website that utilizes its Move Trainer technology to help you learn and remember opening lines, tactical patterns, and end games. It is endorsed by GM Magnus Carlson and features courses from I am John Bartholomew, Sam Shanklin. Wesley So, and so many others. Chessable has over 100,000 members and features hundreds of courses, both for free and for purchase. So if you haven't checked it out yet, please go to chessable.com and take a look around. Back to the interview. And we're back. So Vishnu, your, your work ethic online, at least as far as I can tell, and at least like when you were kind of really hitting the books hard, was was quite impressive to the extent where I sometimes worried a bit about your work-life balance just from a distance, uh, to, to be honest. Um, so after you read those initial books, obviously you're getting more involved in the online community. Um, what was your, your chess regimen like uh, in that period where you were uh, pretty, pretty immersed in chess? Yeah, I would say at the height of doing that, I was maybe spending an hour or two in the morning and then a further hour at night. Uh, so I would say two to three hours per day. And I was thinking about chess uh, during almost every waking hour, except when I was at work, probably, even, even sometimes during work. Uh, I was dreaming about chess positions. Um, I, I have this memory of waking up very often. Uh, with a memory of a tactical sequence on, in some position. So it was that, I was that immersed in it. Um, wow. and, and your concerns are actually legit. Uh, so it was <laughs> affecting both family and professional life. Uh, and that was a huge issue. And I've been working on getting some balance ever since. And it's been, it's been a steady way, uh, I would say, back to a balanced life. And I think I'm currently happy with where that is uh, at. 
Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. that's good to hear, honestly, because, yeah, I mean, I don't know you personally. Obviously, we've interacted online a fair amount. But, yeah, I mean, it just seemed like I knew you had a kid. You know, I knew I knew you had other things going on. So I would just, you know, obviously, I love chess and I want people to, to get better, but not at the expense of, like, uh, you know, a job or a marriage or something yeah, exactly. like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah. Um, so now it does seem like you still you still active and i know also like uh in in your professional work in particular like there's going to be ebbs and flows mm -hmm. um so there are periods i'm sure where you could could work harder um but so let's let's discuss the actual studying so you're studying maybe more hours than you should be <laughs> in a perfect world um and what is what was it that, that you were doing so I would say these extreme uh, hours were uh, these these happened in spurts in, in bursts I would say so I, it it wasn't like I was spending you know five months doing this it was more like a month of extreme focus and then I would maybe do the normal thing of an hour a day or two hours a day um, and after every such burst I experienced a rating gain um, so I mean that was my style of working. Um, and sorry, what was your question? Was it about the specific things? I was so what were, you, what were you doing? So what were, your, what were you studying? So two hours in the morning, like what are you doing for those two hours? Yeah, so um, at some point, I don't know exactly at which point during my study, but uh, I was doing things like solving endgame studies. For, so mornings usually were endgame studies because I wanted to do it uh, when I was most focused. Uh, so the hard calculation work was reserved for the morning. So it would be either Kasparian's uh, domination studies or something like uh, Jakob Ogard's uh, positional play, uh, things like this. But now we are talking wow. about when I was 1800 or so. Um, yeah, I was going to say, those are fairly advanced parts. Yeah, so this was uh, after I had uh, gone past 1800, 1850. Uh, before that, I was uh, working on more basic books like uh, Live Shits, uh, Test Your Chess IQ, uh, things like this. But I was still writing down full solutions. I was still trying to uh, calculate and everything. Uh, so, so the calculation work happened in the morning. Uh, I was also reading game collections. Uh, so, you know, Tal Botvinnik, 1960, for example, is uh, a book that I read early, Understanding Chess Move by Move, John Nunn. So these kinds of books. Um, and then uh, I also... Uh, contacted Jesse Cry uh, pretty early on in my development. So he uh, instilled in me uh, this belief that, uh, you know, to improve, you need to analyze your own game. So I was doing that a lot as well. Um, yeah, so I would say basic tactics, calculation, uh, analyzing my own games. These uh, form the main uh, aspects of chess training early on. Okay, and these books that you mentioned, uh could we consider them recommendations? Are there any of them that you felt like weren't the best use of your time, or they all? I mean, they're they're all pretty pretty well respected. So, but I just want to make sure we're, we're steering people the right way. Yeah, I would recommend those. Uh, in general, I think uh, there is an abundance of excellent chess material, uh, and ultimately, it really doesn't matter which books you pick up, as long as you're doing the core work right. That is tactics and. Uh, you know, at least uh, getting a sense of what your uh, weaknesses and strengths are so that you can, you know, further plan your uh, training appropriately. But other than that, just reading whatever you're interested in, just absorbing, you know, chess culture, just thinking about chess, being a bit obsessive, I think is necessary uh, for improvement. Um, so, yeah, so as long as you do all of that core work and read uh, good chess books, I think that should do the trick. Yeah, it's like exercise. The best, the best fitness exercise is the one that you're going to do. Right. Exactly. Um, yeah. So Jesse Cry, of course, is legendary for his uh, his attention to detail when it comes to analyzing games and writing pages and pages of notes. Um, so it's good that he imparted that work ethic to you. And of course, listeners can hear my interviews with him as well as check out his videos on Chess Dojo if you want uh, to hear more about that. Um, so how often were you playing? You mentioned analyzing your games. Was this only tournament games, Vishnu, or were you also doing training games online, which I know you have done? Uh, no online training games at this point, uh, because there was no um, big need to do, the, do it at that point, uh, because I, I uh, was playing weekly games at the NIH uh, chess club. Um, so I got in at least one classical game per week, so I would analyze those. And then I think I was playing uh, a big tournament once a month or maybe once once in two months. So these gave me enough games to look at and analyze and submit to Jesse's uh, show as well. 
Yeah, was, so Jesse's show, um, I can't remember what it's called. It was a weekly show on chess.com. Is that show still going or is he just strictly dojo now? Um, it was a monthly show. Uh, it, was okay. just, it was just called Member uh, Analysis. Um, but I think it's right now it's on Chess Dojo. Okay, um, cool. Yeah, and so much good stuff there. So listeners, um, definitely, as, as always, I recommend it. So Vishnu, we got a, a bunch of good question, questions from uh, Patreon supporters. <clears throat> Excuse me. You guys always come out strong for the adult improver interviews. So the first one is from uh, Augusto Royoba. And uh, Augusto asks, he says, um, I have a couple of questions. He says, number one, tactics training. Do you have a preference between Lee Chess, chess.com, or books? Do you analyze your own games? Do you use a coach for that? And what steps do you typically follow? Yeah, when it comes to tactics, especially early on, I would highly recommend using books um, and writing down your solutions uh, completely before you look up the solutions. Uh, several other people on your podcast have touched upon this. Um, and the reason simply being that uh, when you work with online tactics trainers, they sometimes entice you to uh, guess moves because you can immediately see the, the computer's response and then you can go from there. Right, and sometimes it's really easy to get into these bad habits if you stick to online tactics trainers. At least, uh, you know, before you formed uh, good habits. So I would say, uh, in order to form good habits, uh, I would recommend using books and writing down full solutions. And once you think you're uh, safe from these bad habits, then I think it's it's fine to use any of these online uh, trainers. You're never safe, Vishnu. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've, I've even heard people on your podcast say that when they go on the chess.com trainer, for example, they set it up on a board and actually write down their solutions. Um, was it Vi Vinesh or someone? Uh, I don't remember who it was, but there are hardcore people who do that and, uh, you know, reap benefits uh, from doing it. Um, yeah, so that's that's about tactics. And as far as uh, analyzing my own games go, uh, I, I pretty much follow what uh, Jesse Cry has told me to do. Uh, I, you know, I go over the game on a real chessboard. I have my notebook and pen. I annotate my uh, thoughts uh, that happen during the game and also do some analysis uh, during the course of uh, annotating the game. And then eventually I do an engine check to make sure that I haven't missed, you know, tactics. Um, and then I consult Jesse, especially on the games where I felt like I did not have a good idea of what was going on. Uh, I consult him uh, through this monthly show. Um, yeah, I, I haven't really spent money on coaching so far, um, but I, I've tried to u make use of these these uh, free uh, opportunities. Okay, yeah, and I believe, um, yeah, there are so many resources, especially guys. If you if you pop in, I mean, uh, Chess Dojo, they're they're incredibly generous with their time and knowledge. But um, any strong player who's doing a Twitch stream that um, you know not getting you know ten thousand viewers, not not uh, Levy Roseman or Hikaru Nakamura, but if you see someone with like a hundred viewers or less or somewhere around there, and you pop in and you ask them like actionable questions, that's great content for them. So often you can get help, possibly even send in a game. But of course, um, if you can afford it, getting a coach is a, a great way to go as as well. Um, so over the years, is there any resource that stands out to you? And, and I'm also curious about how you budget your study time. Were you kind of regimented about how much time you spent on each thing or just kind of do what you're interested in within chess? So initially, I was extremely regimented. I would write down the number of minutes or hours that I would spend on each of these aspects. I would break it down into proportions, you know, percentages, um, you know, try to do more analysis, both in terms of calculation and analyzing my own games, least amount of time for openings, at least in the beginning, um, some time in the end game, but not quite as much as I should have. But anyway, I had this breakdown and I, I did that initially. But um, as I progressed, I, found that sometimes uh, in order for you to uh, keep working on chess in a sustained way, sometimes you just have to do things that, you know, interest, uh, things that interest you. Uh, for me, uh, that includes going over master games from game collections that I love uh, going over, uh, such as the Test of Time, you know, Kasparov's uh, Test of Time, uh, Gufel's The Art of the King's Indian. You know, there are some classic books that, that really instill in you a love for the game. And so that is what I like to do 
uh, in addition to the core work that I mentioned about calculation and, and tactics and analyzing games. Cool. Yeah. And I saw your post on Facebook that you're trying to tighten up that chess book collection before you leave the country. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Yeah. And test of time. I know that's a favorite of Jesse Cry's. Uh, not not so easy to get, but you'd say it's uh, worth it. Yes. And and I set my mind to finding all available copies in the world. And I actually, <laughs> I actually got, got a hold of like three different copies. I gifted one uh, to Jesse and I have others uh, that I plan to gift uh, people. Uh, but yeah. You're going to corner the market. It's going to be the new GameStop stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. So we have um, we have another listener question from another uh, active um, uh, active member of the chess Twitter community, uh, Justine Lagstrand. Um, and he asks, uh, what are the biggest mistakes you have made regarding tra chess training and how do you suggest others avoid them? That's a great question. Uh, thanks, uh, Justine, for the question. Um, I would probably break that up into two parts. One is in childhood and one is in adulthood. In childhood, I would say uh, not even looking at any of my games was probably my biggest mistake. I imagine I would have gotten stronger had I at least gotten a sense of my weaknesses uh, because the earlier uh, in life you work on them, the better um, because you have you know fewer responsibilities as a kid. So uh, it was possible for me to improve uh, much faster then. Um, in adulthood, I guess not realizing the importance of systematic calculation very early on uh, was one of my biggest mistakes. I realized that when I did a one day training camp online with uh, RB Ramesh, and he had a set of really nice example positions that he took us through, and uh, he verbalized a very systematic approach to calculation. And that's the first time that I even understood that you could be uh, disciplined about calculation. Um, and soon after that, my uh, tactics rating on all of these you know, websites, they shot right up. Uh, and so that, that, that sort of thing works. And my, I, I think it also influenced my game. I was calculating more efficiently. Uh, um, and so, yeah, so in adulthood, I, I wish I had focused on accuracy and uh, systematic calculation very early on when solving tactics in other positions. Good stuff. Yeah, R.B. Ramesh has written a great book, and now he's opened his own chess academy um, online that listeners can check out. But but what do you remember about what you imparted from the systematic approach that he advocated? Like, what could you share with listeners? Yeah, so the first thing uh, is about candidate moves. And, um, you know, Kotov's uh, famed tree of analysis is sometimes ridiculed by people, but it has a lot of value. Uh, so that's the first thing that I learned from Ramesh. So identify a few finalists to be your move. Okay, go on. <laughs> so um, So basically the advice was, Make a list of candidates for both you and your opponent. Uh, I mean, this works in uh, critical positions mostly. Uh, but let's say you have a critical position. Uh, you make a list of candidates, reasonable candidates for both sides, and then you go down that list. But of course, there are other things that Kotov did not talk about in his original work that we, that we can talk about in a second. But making a list of candidates is very important, and he showed us how to do that uh, systematically. The next, okay, well, hold on yeah. real quick. How would, how would a, a listener be able to identify that it might be a critical position? Okay, that comes from experience, and that is where intuition in chess uh, comes in. Uh, so th this is why you have to uh, play a lot. Uh, analyze your games, you know, try and develop the sense for uh, critical positions, uh, go over master games. Uh, in that way, you you get a sense of how uh, games develop and uh, reach these critical positions so that you, you can have you can anticipate this happening in your own games. So that that that's how I, I would say uh, that intuition develops. Um, okay. And yeah, just just to add a, a couple quick notes, I mean, an if you ever find yourself in a position where there's a very forcing sequence of captures, and especially if there's multiple captures, that's probably a critical moment. And I, uh, in my classes, often parrot what uh, Grandmaster Jakob Agard has written, where if you're trying to figure out if you can calculate, you might ask yourself, like, is this a position where calculation is likely to be rewarded? If it's like some quiet position where neither side has a piece past their respective third rows, um, maybe you don't need to go crazy with the calculation, mm -hmm. but if there's lots of loose pieces or an exposed king or something like that, uh, that's a suggestion that it that it might be a critical moment. Okay, but let's get back to the calculation framework. Sorry. Yeah. So Ramesh uh, talks about CCTP in these positions. It's it's about force moves. So CCTP stands for checks, captures, threats, and pawn breaks in this order. So if you consider in a critical position, if you consider moves of of this nature in this order. That will help you 
uh, come up with a list of candidate moves in the order of priority for both yourself and your opponent. Um, and what you said about uh, Jakob uh, Ogard's uh, advice is also very important. In fact, that is one of my main weaknesses where I try to look for concrete solutions in quiet positions um, mm -hmm. because my training has emphasized these critical positions so much that I try to look for these concrete solutions in quiet positions and I end up burning time on my clock. I, I guess you've seen me do that in some of my games. Um, yeah, so so that that's a big weakness that I have. But when it comes to critical positions, yeah, forcing moves, uh, making a list of candidates, being very disciplined about it, and slowing down initially, uh, just focusing on accuracy. Don't worry about the time. Don't worry about the time bonus that chess.com gives you. Uh, you know, that those, those only, uh, again, encourage you to uh, inculcate bad habits. Okay, good stuff. And yeah, I would say listeners like, you know, of course, as we've said, anything you study would be good, but this this hard calculation work that Vishnu has been um, quite willing to sort of dive into the deep end of, um, there's there's very few things that will pay as many dividends as as just like really trying to solve the problems and not just clicking buttons, but really writing out solutions and uh, trying to find the best move for both sides and just being being methodical. And I have to confess, I don't do as much of it as I should, even though I still need to. But uh, but it, you you get a great bang for your buck. Um, so so we've got some other topics I want to get to soon, Vishnu, because of course, as a one of the rare cognitive scientists on the show, I want you to try to tie all that together. Um, but before we we move on to that. So what, what's your bullet pointed advice? Like I know, for example, you did a few Twitch streams with a friend of yours who was newer to chess, um, showing him how you felt he should approach it. So if there's, if there's someone who wants to replicate uh, the success you've had, what, what, what like three bits of advice would you give them if I can put you on the spot? Yeah, sure. Um, so I assume you're talking about someone under 1500, let's say. Yeah. Yeah, so in that case, um, Starting openings is not really all that important. Um, I would say uh, as long as you uh, have a book like, uh, let's say, Logical Chess Move by Move, uh, you know, you go over uh, many classic, uh, you know, one E4 games, you get a sense of basic opening principles. And then what you do is you don't, you don't study too much. You go play, right? Uh, go play, uh, I would say, at a minimum 15-minute games, with, uh, ideally with some increment. And then you do uh, an analysis of it. Now, initially, you will not really have a good sense of what to analyze because your knowledge base is not filled in. You will do what you can and then do an engine check. But ideally, you will consult with a stronger chess playing friend or a coach if you can afford one. And that's that again, I mean, it, it all goes back to this analyzing game framework uh, that I think is, is still important for someone under 1500. Um, so that is the main work that I would suggest. And also basic endgame uh, work, king and pawn endgames. Uh, that's another place where you will gain tons of points against people at your strength because they will not know uh, those endgames most likely. Uh, so that work can pay rich dividends as well. So it's basic tactics, playing long time control games with consultation with a stronger friend, and uh, yeah, this basic endgame work. Okay, yeah, excellent advice. But number one thing, of course, is to do the work. Mm -hmm. um, so on that note, we're going to take another break to hear from a sponsor, and we will be back momentarily. In case you have not heard about our friends and sponsors, aimchess.com, I wanted to tell you a bit about what they offer. Basically, what they do is they collect your games, they scrape your games automatically from chess.com and Lee Chess, and then give you data-driven trends and analysis of what you can work on, your own personalized scouting report. So whether it be tactics or converting advantages or certain openings, they point you in the right direction and give you personalized lessons to help clean up your game. So there's a free version that you can check out just to get a taste of what they do. And then if you like it and you choose to subscribe, use the promo code CHESS30 and you can save 30% and they will know that you came from Perpetual Chess. All right, back to the interview. Have a look at aimchess.com. Okay, and we are back, Vishnu, and we have a few um, Patreon mailbag questions related to the intersection of your love for chess and your work. Um, so let's uh, dive in because we have a few from uh, Jason Murray. So we'll take them one by one. Uh, and thanks for the support, Jason. Uh, Jason asks, he says, 
Do you have any general insights into chess thought process given your background as a cognitive psychologist? How can an adult improver study practices and thought processes over the board? Yeah, so improve study practices and thought processes over the board. Sorry. Right. Uh, yeah, again, great question, uh, but one that will probably have a disappointing answer, which is what most experts uh, will tell you if, if, if you ask this question, which is basically that we don't have, uh, you know, a vast array of systematic studies into chess improvement, uh, I don't think, to the best of my knowledge. Um, so I would say it is probably best, uh, given that's the case, it's probably best to heed the advice of successful coaches in this regard. So. Um, again, I would emphasize systematic and disciplined calculation, balanced study with playing and analyzing, analyzing your own games, you know, thought process over the board, uh, then would be a matter of putting what you trained into practice. Now here, maybe I can give you some insight from uh, cognitive science, uh, especially from the cognitive science of memory. Uh, we know that there are context effects. That is, if you match the context in which you study something and the context in which you're tested, then that usually has a benefit. What that means is that during training, you should probably uh, maximize the extent to which your training environment uh, mimics uh, actual tournament situation. Um, so once you've done the basic you know, tactics and calculation work, I would recommend you work with a book where you have positions all mixed up. You have quiet positions in there. You have tactical positions in there. You, know, you have positional decisions that you need to make. Nobody telling you what, what uh, you know, the position uh, calls for. So that kind of training can be really helpful. Um, uh, I can also, this reminds me of something that I used to do when I was uh, 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 training piano, when I was serious about it. I had this big issue of nervousness uh, when playing for other people. Um, so there was heightened uh, you know, heart rate when that happened and that would uh, affect my you know, motor skills when playing the piano. So as part of training, then I, I incorporated these these uh, cardio exercises to uh, uh, increase my heart rate, so as to mimic uh, the situation that I would be in eventually. So, so again, it all goes back to trying to make your training environment um, match as closely as possible to your uh, test environment, which is, in this case would be the tournament uh, situation. Yeah, um, excellent advice. And for listeners looking for specific recommendations, because I do think it's a good point about having positions where you don't know if there's there's a tactic. And certainly that's been suggested by uh, other guests as well. Um, Practical Chess Exercises by Ray Cheng uh, is a good book, I'd say, for ideally 1400 to 1800 range, something like that. Um, and there's the uh, Lev Albert Chess Training Pocket Book 1 and 2, kind of old little books, but um, with a lot of classic puzzles, and most of them are tactics, but there's enough to keep you on your toes. Um, Woodpecker Method, of course, famously has a few red herrings, as they call them in it, where there's a, a puzzle with no answer, although that that book is fairly fairly advanced, I would say uh, 1,500 on up before you would want to um, try that. Can you think of any other, um, any other suggestions? Yeah, I think this recent book by um, Elshan and Sabina Foisar, um, the Sherlock method, I think, has mm. has this uh, this going for it. Uh, there's also I forget the author's name, but I think it's called Universal Chess Training. I haven't. Ah, uh, yeah, he was on the show. Uh, Woj Ah, exactly. Yeah, yeah I, I think uh, that book probably has positions of this. Yeah, this it's good. Yeah, yeah. Hard though, hard again. Right. Like he, mm. I would say, uh, sixteen hundred on up, something like that. Mm -hmm. Um. And I, I actually, when you mentioned uh, the the forcing move sequence that uh, Grandmaster Ramesh mentioned, um, checks, captures, uh, threats, and pawn breaks, I was a little bit uh, surprised to hear the uh, inclusion of pawn breaks because you hear many, many versions of uh, similar advice. Mine mm -hmm. is generally checking captures, checks, captures, threats. Um, mm -hmm. pick, picked it up from uh, Elizabeth, on, uh, Elizabeth Pate's YouTube video to, to look at checking captures first. Um, just because you're kind of getting uh, two for the price of one mm -hmm. in terms of your forcing moves in those situations. But have you f found including pawn breaks? And for listeners who don't know, a pawn break is basically a move that's going to force open a file um, where there's often, most commonly, there would be two pawns that can't move, two pawns locked. And you, if you push the adjacent pawn, your opponent has no choice in the opening of the file. Um, do you find that to be like a helpful addition when you're solving chess puzzles? Um... 
Yeah, I haven't really thought about that in the context of chess puzzles, but in general, I think uh, pawn breaks have a forcing nature in that it changes the pawn structure. It forces your opponent to make a decision. Uh, let's say you're in a slightly worse position. Maybe it's a pawn break that you need to think about to change the nature of the position, for example. Right. Uh, it's also uh, often important in the end game where a pawn break can be the difference between a win and, let's say, a draw. Uh, this actually reminds me of this book, uh, Van Perlow's uh, End Game Tactics. The first, yeah. the first chapter is mostly about these pawn breaks in the end game, which are fascinating. Um, I've actually saved a, a, a game or two based on you know pawn breaks in the end game after reading that chapter. So I think yeah, so pawn breaks by virtue of being forcing uh, should be part of this this list of you know forcing moves. I think it's helpful. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Cool. And let's get back to Jason's uh, question because there's more. And here comes the big part. Um, so. Question number two from Jason Murray is, he says, um, it seems to me that many chess improvers work very hard through study, play, et cetera, and fail to enjoy significant gains. And then he has three related questions. Why do you think that is? What can they do to identify and remove these roadblocks? And is whatever your previous advice different for, for me at the 1200 level? Yeah, again, the big million dollar question right and yeah and i know you've been vocal about this one online so i'm ready <laughs> <laughs> okay so my guess is that for something as complex as chess to be really absorbed you need a certain level of obsession you uh, look at the interviews of all these you know child uh, chess prodigies right they're thinking about chess 24 7 basically nihal sarin is playing blitz all day uh, however it's not mindless blitz it's blitz uh, being overlooked by his coaches there are incremental changes being made after every few, you know, blitz games. And he's basically thinking chess every waking hour, right? And they have nothing else that they need to think about, uh, especially early on. Um, and so all of this is why kids seem to improve at this kind of rate. Um, so many adults, too, have, uh, you know, obsession, but many of them are playing, you know, 200 bullet games a day. So it's not that kind of obsession I'm talking about. Uh, like I said earlier, when I was you know, really deep in, in this, I was dreaming chess, basically. I was dreaming of tactical positions. Um, so if you have that kind of obsession and if you're doing the right kind of work, uh, for example, if you're watching high-level uh, games online without turning on the engine, trying to really analyze the positions yourself, uh, you know, what percentage of adults really do this, right? do this kind of work? You know, my guess would be 5%. So if that's the case, if 5% if of adult improvers are doing the actual work that we think, you know, based on uh, advice from all successful coaches and, and people in the past, uh, if 5% is the number, then it's not too surprising that adults have a very hard time uh, making these improvements, right? And so this 5% number may also have to do with just life circumstances. I feel like people uh, give a casual nod to life circumstances when talking about adult improvement and then immediately switch to easier explanations like, you know, brain differences and genetics. But I think uh, we need to seriously consider uh, life circumstances as, as an explanation. If you want me to talk about cognitive psychology of, of human memory, there is this notion in, in the literature called interference in memory. Um, so that is, uh, if you have a lot of additional experiences, they interfere with your memory for something mm -hmm. that you want to remember, right? And you can imagine that as adults, you have lots more responsibilities, you have lots of thoughts, you know, going on, and all of this can interfere with something as specific as chess that you're trying to uh, train and, and get better at. So, you know, all of this works against an adult uh, trying to improve. So these are the roadblocks, right? Um, yeah, when, when I was obsessed with chess and playing uh, these under 1600, under 1700 uh, sections, uh, there were some kids who were, uh, you know, rightly called local prodigies here. And then recently when I was playing under 2000 or 2200, these were the same kids in the under 2200 section. So most of my buddies were these, these little kids. Uh, however, this kind of obsession was destroying my both professional and family life. And I, I don't think adults can sustain it unless you have very specific life circumstances that allow you to do that without destroying your the rest of your life. Uh, so that, in my mind, is the most plausible and simplest explanation for why adults cannot uh, make the improvements that you see these kids making. So that, that's my view of uh, adult improvement. So Vishnu, you said a lot of interesting things there. I, I really, I barely know where to begin, but one thing I can tell you, so, and 
I feel like, uh, as is often the case, maybe arguing online has isn't the best way to do it. Like, I feel like you made a pretty compelling reasoned case, whereas sometimes when these arguments have cropped up online, it feels like people are kind of uh, sort of ye- doing the internet equivalent of uh, yelling past each other mm-hmm. about like the role of um, talent and age in inability to improve at chess. But one thing I've noticed in my experience, of course, being um, uh, very good friends as a kid with I am Greg Shahadi and just seeing young phenoms like uh, Hikaru Nakamura rise through the ranks and, of course, getting to talk to so many um, incredibly accomplished chess players is what you're saying about kids being totally immersed in chess definitely rings true to me. But I don't feel like they necessarily study that much. Like Hikaru is legendary for saying like he didn't read a lot of chess books. He just played, played, played. And I feel like, and okay, maybe it has to do with what you were saying about this idea of interference or maybe like something involving like neurons being assigned to a certain task. This is more your your territory than mine, to be sure. But I don't see the kids studying that much. And with the adult improvers, now granted, maybe they're not doing the most deliberative practice in terms of calculation exercises and stuff like that and mimicking um, over the board, uh, critical decision type conditions, but kids aren't doing that either. Mm-hmm. So other than the obsession, like why is it that, that kids learn so much faster? Yeah. You know, I can do away with all of my books and still make the same improvement that I did. If only I could analyze, uh, with stronger players, uh, for, you know, two hours, three hours after each of my games at these tournaments. One of the main differences that I see between adults playing these weekend tournaments and kids is that when kids are done with their games, they go off with their friends, they hang out in big groups. They often analyze games, but also they just play. And as uh, during the course of playing whatever, you know, blitz, bullet, they keep analyzing. Uh, in fact, analysis is a core aspect of chess skill. You know, someone like uh, Dvoretsky would completely agree with that. Right. And so how do you pick up these analysis skills? A very good way to do that is to analyze with your peers who may be stronger than you. Right. Uh, So when people like, you know, Jan Gustafsson or, you know, Swidler say that they don't really read books. By the way, uh, Swidler did read a lot of books. uh, Yeah, he did. Uh, Yeah. He 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 talked about how he would get back from home, throw his you know school back down and just basically sit and read books. So it's it's not necessarily the case that, you know, all of these prodigies never read books. You know, Nigel Short is famous for having thousands of books and actually having read them. So, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, a significant chunk of these these prodigies who grew up to be elite players, they, they read significant amounts, right? Magnus, too, yeah. Yeah, Magnus. Um, now, Hikaru had a very different style, but but he was playing against, I remember, this, this chess computer. And, and his stepfather, for example, was one of the top, you know, chess coaches in the world. Right. Yeah. So, again, you, you don't really know what they had access to. Uh, obviously, they had an aptitude for the game very early on. They had the spark that made them obsessed about the game, which I think is a prerequisite. But after that, it's all about access and the different kinds of things that you're able to do. I think it might involve reading books. It might involve playing a chess computer. It might involve having a stepfather who's the, you know, who's a top coach. You know, it might involve several different things. There are several different paths to, I think, chess improvement. But, you know, kids have, uh, you know, a lot of these elite players uh, in their childhoods, they, they had many of these going for them, I think. Okay. Yeah. And one area where I feel like you you sort of, the disagreement really became more clearly um, uh, uh, distinct was in terms of like what an adult could accomplish in terms of improvement. Mm-hmm. Like... Uh, Coaches like I am Kostya Kavutsky and Jesse Cry from Chess Dojo, and I have to say I basically agree with them. I feel like it's just for an adult, say fourteen hundred to make master. Mm-hmm. Um, it it happens so seldom yeah. that we just feel like it must be um, borderline impossible. Like obviously, a few people have done it, but. Um, it's, it seems like it's less than 1%. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas you seem to think like lots of people could do it. Um, so could you speak about sort of the, the the neurology behind that maybe? Because that's sort of, that's more your department and that's where we're kind of, um, we're speaking more, um, more anecdotally, I feel like. Yeah, so I think, uh, you know, a few moments back, I described to you the practical challenges that adults face. And so the statistics basically say that this is close to impossible, but I think where we differ is the attribution of cause. 
Um, so, you know, some people uh, who I've had these discussions with online, they believe it's genetics. Some people believe it's brain differences between adults and kids. Now, obviously, there are brain differences between adults and kids, but whether these differences are what lead to these huge differences in ability to improve, no one really knows. Uh, so in science, there's this concept of, you know, the simpler the explanation, uh, the more likely it is to be right. So mm -hmm. we know that everything that we talked about so far about these practical challenges are true, right? And we know that uh, th this all leads to uh, non-ideal ways of studying and playing chess. Um, so that to me is a simpler explanation. So I don't think we disagree that it is uh, statistically very improbable for a 1400 to make master. Where we disagree, I think, is the attribution. Uh, so I think in principle, it is actually possible for people to make master. Uh, the, the hurdle is not their brain. The hurdle is not their genetics. Uh, th there is no strong evidence that suggests that that is the case. Um, so that's, that's I would say, that uh, I would say is the source of disagreement. Okay. I mean, and certainly that's a fair point. Kids do have more time unequivocally. But in terms of Occam's razor, kids also, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but they unequivocally do sort of uh, forge these neural pathways at a faster rate than, than adults. Is that, is that right? Yeah, I mean, neuroscience is complex. There are, it's also the case that, uh, you know, kids, when you're very young, you have a lot more neurons, but then you prune them away. Uh, that is, you you uh, eventually end up losing uh, these neurons and no one, uh, you know, um, but it's still possible to pick up skills uh, later on uh, in, in your adulthood. I mean, you'd, you know, someone like me, uh, I, I did not get into neuroscience before the age of, what, 24, 25. Uh, I'm learning new tricks every day, right? Um, so, so people do that all the time. Um, so, I, I mean, it is, it is plausible that, uh, it is highly beneficial for you to learn the rules of a complex game early on in life and at least have the basics going for you. Uh, and it, it seems to be really important uh, when you are talking about elite levels of chess, right? To have done that work very early on. Now we are talking about the zenith of human achievement, right? That is a different discussion. I think when you're talking about making 2000, and then you go into discussions about genetic limits or you know brain differences. That's where I think that you need far stronger evidence to make those those claims. Um, so that's that's where I think I disagree with people. Yeah, I mean, but I wouldn't even like. It's just a question where someone has to form an opinion. You know, I don't think I wouldn't like. I wouldn't think of, for example, I, as I mentioned, I tend to side with uh, what what Jesse and Kostya said, but I don't think they're like making a strident claim. It's more like. If there's a gun to your head, like what you know, what do you think is possible, and you just think yeah, so, more, more is possible? Yeah, uh, let me actually uh, tell you what Avatik of Chess Mood actually told me on our one-on-one -on -one call, right? So he usually asks people the question, "What is your why? You know, what is the reason? Yeah. What is the reason you want to make your goal? I don't know. It can be making FM, it can be making IM, but why do you want to do it? Right? You need to have a very strong reason to want to do it in the first place." I would say most adults don't have a very good reason. Uh, that's my guess. Uh, however, uh, if, if your goal was to make FM so that you can feed your family, right? Uh, let's say that would bring you book deals. If that was that critical, and if you had, if you were a you know, reasonably intelligent person with a good work ethic, you know, I think the chances are much higher than it would be otherwise. Uh, so yeah, I, I would say the power of belief, uh, I mean, there has to be something to be said for it. Uh, but also the power of uh, having uh, a big enough uh, reason for having a goal. I, I see a lot of people have, uh, you know, they write road to I am uh, in their profiles, right? Yeah. Uh, however, if you if you look at the descriptions of their work that they do, they may be working one hour a day. Um, yeah. it's, it, it doesn't cut it. Uh, so, for example, in that same online camp that I did with RB Ramesh, he says, he asks his students, school-going kids, to work for four hours a day on chess when school is in session and six to eight hours a day when it is summer vacation, right? And so that's the kind of work that all of these kids do. Um, if, you, if you compare, if you, so the ratio is something like, you know, six to one when you compare kids who make these rapid uh, strides versus serious adult improvers input. Uh, so that by itself, right, again, uh, could account for a lot of these differences that we're talking about. Yeah, it's a good point. It's it's endlessly fascinating to me and to you as well. And as I know you've alluded to um, in, in the lab that you'll be opening in, in, in India, uh, hopefully doing some chess research. So. Yeah, hopefully, yeah.
that would, that would be great to, to get more, more insight. Um, all right, let's get to uh, part three of Jason's question, um, which was, uh, does our previous discussion, does it change when he's rated at USCF 1200 level? Yeah, the nice thing about being at 1200 is that one, if you're playing rated tournaments, you have access to a lot of stronger players. And that is a prerequisite to improving your rating. Uh, I mean, there, there's this guy at my uh, chess club who is the top rated player, and he's been stuck at his rating for several years now. However, four years back, he was like 1850, and he was not the highest rated player. And so he could improve because he was playing stronger players than himself, right? Uh, so, so 1200 is a great place to be. So there is a 65 plus year old guy at the club. He's a retired doctor. He learned the rules just five years back. He's currently around 1400 uh, USCF. Uh, all he does is he comes to the club, he goes over master games, he asks us, the other stronger players, why certain moves make sense. He analyzes his games after he plays us, you know, post-mortems. You know, as long as you're obsessed in a certain way and you do the basic, you know, playing and analyzing and your basic tactics, at 1200, you should definitely be able to make progress. Um, yeah, so so the advice, the, the challenges that uh, a 2000 faces are very different from the challenges that are 14 or a 1200 faces, I think. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. And I do think the, the access to more players um, helps, but there's also just, and I feel like the calculation work in particular um, can you can improve more quickly. The, the newer to chess you are, the more sort of, um, classic patterns that you may, maybe haven't been exposed to that that you can work to learn. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I know that everyone has periods of plateau, which is sort of another sort of uh, argument. I don't know if we would call it an argument, but like that was sort of one of the uh, pressure points in your conversation <laughs> with uh, with uh, Jesse and Kostya. Yeah. Um, so even if you're stuck at, at 1200, I still I think that that's an area where I would definitely say no, no matter your age, um, no matter how long you've been stuck there, um, if, if you grind, you know, 10, 15 hours a week uh, for sure, then you can, you can pick up mm -hmm. uh, 100 to 200 points at least. Mm -hmm. um, okay. A couple more questions um, related to cognitive science and life. Uh, this one is from Colum Higgins, who says, do you see much evidence for a link between studying and playing chess and long-term positive outcomes for brain health? Um, again, I, I, I don't. I wouldn't call myself an expert in this particular domain. So my uh, domain of expertise is just human memory. Um, however, I would say that yeah, it, it is it is plausible that there are links between. So uh, so a link means a correlation, right? Um, so. Even if there's a correlation between studying, playing chess, and long-term positive outcomes for uh, health, you really don't know what causes uh, what. So this is the question I think that could be more interesting. So the more interesting question is, does playing chess actually cause you to have better you know, brain outcomes uh, in the long run? Now, that is an incredibly complex question um, because it's very difficult to establish uh, causation. I like to give this example in my introductory classes, right? So, uh, for example, uh, there is a huge link between shark bites and ice cream sales. Hmm. It's highly correlated, right? But, you know, why are they correlated? That's because both of these happen more in the summer. So there's a third variable that affects both of these uh, events. So it's very difficult to make inferences about cause based on a correlation that you observe. You need to do a, you know, tons more work to figure out what's causing what. And so that's that's the problem with answering this question. Unfortunately, I don't have an answer, but this is the reason I don't have an answer. Yeah. Well, spoken like a true scientist, because certainly, you know, there have been some studies published. I'm not sure like how respected they are in the field, but about um, chess playing and and uh, helping to stave off dementia and obviously not just chess playing like Sudoku and crossword puzzles and mm -hmm. like anything that where you're not doing something passive you're doing something actively involving the brain. Yeah, like I said, all of these are likely to be correlations. You can easily imagine like you were born into uh, a good family situation. You uh, were exposed to good you know role models that uh, enabled you to pick up you know activities such as Sudoku and chess. Uh, but because of your early life experiences also had better, you know, brain health outcomes. 
so it could be an entirely different third variable that could cause these things to be correlated. We never know. So that's that's the issue with drawing inferences from from a correlation. Okay, very measured, but, <laughs> but prob probably fair. Um, all right, we're going to take one more break and hear from our aforementioned friends at Chess Mood and then get back to it. Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by ChessMood.com. Here is what Chess Mood offers. It is a subscription-based website that provides a comprehensive opening repertoires both for white and for black. They also have middle game and end game videos from their cast of professional Grandmaster trainers. They also have some free content that you can check out. Grandmaster Avchek Gregorian, who's their founder and you can hear on episode 192 of Perpetual Chess, has a blog where he writes about common challenges for tournament players that you can check out for free. And they also started offering free YouTube videos called Daily Lessons with the Grandmaster. So go to their website, check out what they have to offer, and be sure to subscribe to their YouTube as well. And let's get back to the interview. Okay, and we are back and we have another Patreon question for you, Vishnu, dealing with uh, work and life and chess balance from Courtney Fry. Thanks for the support, Courtney. So Courtney asks, do you have advice for how to find the balance between pushing yourself to see improvement in chess while also preserving the enjoyment of chess if you don't get the improvement that you were hoping for, particularly for adults with multiple life responsibilities? How much? How did you decide how much to push yourself as opposed to just enjoying the game? Yeah, great question again, uh, Courtney. Um, I... I'm probably not the best person to ask this question to, given that I've made mistakes in... in well, I think that makes you the best person. <laughs> yeah, perhaps. Um, so I, I used to think that there's no point to doing chess if you're not trying to improve. Uh, I used to think that. However, I modified my stance a while ago because I, I saw people... There, there are people in the chess world who do only maiden tools. There are people who only do end game studies. There are people who only play games and never look at them and still enjoy... Uh, you know, consuming chess. So I've come to the realization that there are many different ways to uh, enjoy and consume chess, and it's all legit, right? Um, now, for someone like me, I don't think it really makes sense to make all these uh, additional sacrifices in both my profession and family life um, if I'm not making uh, improvements in chess, or even if I am making improvements in chess. Um, and and given how effortful my day job will be, uh, I don't think it actually makes sense to um, want to make, uh, you know, for example, to have title ambitions. Um, during this one-on-one -on -one call with Avatik, I basically told him this. So I, I said I had no title ambitions. And he was like, well, you've, made, you've done the work. You've shown that you can do this. And just looking at your general profile, I can think, I, I, I can see that you can make FM in a couple of years if you wanted to. Um, but I, I, I don't I don't think I'm making a mistake here. I think I'm just being wise uh, by saying that it's just not worth uh, the sacrifices that uh, will be demanded of me in terms of both money and time uh, to go play the tournaments that are necessary to make uh, FM, for example. Um, and that will involve lots of sacrifices, both in terms of family and professional life. Uh, so how do you uh, make a decision about you know how uh, how much to emphasize improvement? and how much to emphasize just enjoyment uh, will, again, I think, depend on your reasons for uh, your uh, goal in chess. This goes back to Avatik's why question. You know, what is your why? If it, if it turns out that, you, you know, you have a book that you're writing and you, will, you think it will really, um, you know, make an impact if you get a title in chess, may, you know, maybe it makes sense for you to go for it. So ultimately, I think it's a practical decision and, and the parameters that people use to make the de this decision will vary. What I provided was just my, my personal uh, current uh, parameters for making this sort of a decision. Yeah, I think that's that's good advice, Vishnu. And honestly, like given, given what I had seen from you online, I do think if anything, it's probably an, um, it's good to have the perspective. I mean, obviously, we would love to get better at chess and, you know, sometimes people might feel like they have something to, to improve, but you know, it really, for, for any adult um, who chess is not their livelihood, uh, it shouldn't be the most important thing in your life. Although it can be fun to have those little phases, you know, like if you're not in a relationship and you don't have kids or you have a, you're unemployed or, or you have like a seasonal job, like where you're like, you're a teacher and you don't have as much to do over the summer, like stuff like that. It can be, um, it can be a great, 
um, a great distraction, especially during COVID, crazy news, crazy politics times. Um, chess can be wonderful, but mm -hmm. but we don't want it to um, don't want it to to ruin stuff that's that's really important. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, and um, go ahead. Yeah. Just to follow up on that some more. Um, maybe I made it uh, sound like you have to be extremely practical and uh, materially minded about this. Uh, but but I would say that I don't regret uh, having spent time to make the improvement I did because, you know, I've, I've made, maybe uh, gained about 300, 400 uh, chest strength points, let's say, relative to 2015, where I was in 2015. And that allows me to enjoy chess at a much uh, more subtle and high level than I used to be able to. And I imagine, you know, in my retirement, let's say, you know, when I pick up my chess books, when I, you know, watch chess, I'm going to be able to enjoy that at a much higher level uh, because of the work that I did now. And in that sense, I don't regret it. Uh, but it was very easy for uh, me to have gone on a path of self-destruction um, had I continued with that kind of obsession. Uh, and so I'm glad that I was able to pull it back in and, uh, you know, uh, attain some some sort of balance uh, in life. Yeah, I'm I'm glad to hear that as well. And um, you know, I don't know if your your wife is going to listen to this, Vishnu, and I don't know how comfortable you are talking about it. But w would you be willing to share, like, how serious did the conversations get? How many arguments were you having? I mean, I'm, I'm sure uh, yeah. I'm sure you're not the only one who's dealt with this sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, it was a major challenge. We had lots of discussions about this. You know, I wasn't present. When I was physically present, I wasn't mentally present. You know, yeah. there was a big issue. Uh, and now I myself feel much happier now that I'm actually both mentally and physically present when I spend time with my family. Um, that was close to impossible for me to do, I, I would say, sometime in uh, 2018. Um, yeah, and, and that was a big issue in terms of mental health. Um, so, yeah, so I think people need to take it seriously. But ultimately, you know, uh, sometimes uh, it's it's almost like uh, addiction in some sense, right? It's it's like uh, being addicted to a controlled substance. Uh, sometimes it's really hard to come out of it. Uh, and maybe sometimes you need some external factors to to help you come out of it, uh, such as a big change in, in, in your job, for example, and, and the realization that there's this path will uh, likely not uh, help you succeed. But even that sometimes uh, is not sufficient to push people to uh, attain this balance. So I, so I don't have a very good answer for people struggling with that. Uh, I think I just got lucky uh, in that it was a steady return to balance for me over the last uh, couple of years. Yeah, I mean, my advice would just be err on the side of caution, mm -hmm. <laughs> err on the side of doing less chess, even though I, I hosted a chess podcast. I mean, it's a, you know, if you don't reach your your true chess potential, that's that's not the biggest disaster in the world in life. So, exactly. Yeah. Um, good stuff. And the, the last thing that we didn't talk about too much yet, Vishnu, is your your amazing background in music. I mean, you, you know, as you told Jesse Cry, you you met your wife in your your uh, your your period as a um, local rock star, <laughs> yeah. and uh, and you're classically trained pianist as well, correct? Yes, uh, I started playing the piano at the age of I think six or so, uh, and uh, I started with Western classical piano very early on. So I had a pretty uh, good uh, background in terms of you know basics. And then uh, when I went off to college, I uh, did this internship in Vienna once. Uh, it was a three-month internship, but I took that opportunity to go to really good piano schools there. Uh, and I continued my music education when I came to the U.S. for my uh, Ph.D. So I was training under a pretty good classical pianist. And I also sang with the uh, Ohio State University Symphonic Choir. So I was pretty involved in music all throughout. And, and back in college in India, I also had two rock bands. So these were classic rock bands. We were doing covers of you know, Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, things of that nature. And then in, in 2005, uh, our band decided to do this Pink Floyd tribute concert in this little town of Trishur in this coastal state of Kerala. Uh, there was a very select uh, you know, group of people who uh, was interested in that, that sort of music. But they all came together. We had a great concert. 
and uh, we ended up hiring some people to do background uh, backing vocals uh, because that's that's big in Pink Floyd uh, Pink Floyd's music. And so one of the singers that we hired uh, was my now wife. Uh, and so that's, that's how awesome. we that's how we met. And so I had to train all these singers, you know, writing uh, parts to the music, uh, training them uh, in these backing vocals parts. And that's that's how we ended up spending some time together uh, during training. And then we continued uh, a, a long distance relationship uh, after I went back to college. That's awesome. And how big is uh, like Western music in in India, like Pink Floyd and and the like? Um, in the smaller towns, not not very big at all. Uh, but in the metro cities, uh, yeah, I mean there there is a, a good following uh, for 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 Western music. Cool. And and of course, your daughter um, has has shown some music talent. And you've shared a few clips online, and we're gonna we're gonna try to play her uh, her chess themed. Um, her chess themed uh, little ditty that she wrote uh, on the uh, outro. So just in case we can pull that off, Vishnu, could you could you give a little backing for that? And then I do have one more Patreon question for you too, but let's let's explain that. Yeah, so even before my kid was born, I, I bought these big speakers so that I could blast Mozart, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, even while she was in the womb. Uh, and then when she, uh, you know, after she was born in the first year of her life, I was, her, you know, one of her primary caretakers because I was uh, a stay at home uh, PhD student writing my dissertation at that time. And so I got the chance to really uh, play a lot of good music to her. So I think that was key. Uh, eventually, you know, we have this piano just lying around and she uh, listens to her cartoon music and whatever other music that she listens to and she started picking you know tunes on her own um once i realized that she had perfect uh, memory for pitch because she would often get agitated if either my wife or i uh, sang a song in the wrong key um so that's how i understood that she had perfect uh, memory for pitch once i understood that i uh, gave her the mapping between sounds and the notes on the piano so that way now she can listen to a tone and tell you that it's it's, it's you know G sharp on the piano. So so I think yeah she she's got uh, some good aptitude for music. She also loves to drum. Um, yeah so uh, and recently yeah I, I I shared that clip with you. Uh, she was singing the song that we did not really understand. After a couple of times, we asked her if it was from a cartoon, and she said no. She made it up. We did not really believe her. Then I went closer to the piano, and I looked at the books that were on top of the piano. These were chess books. And then suddenly, her lyrics made sense. She was singing about uh, Everyman Chess, the publisher. <laughs> and she was singing about Rate Your Endgame, which is also a book that I had on top of the piano. And so this is basically the song that you and wrote. fire on board, and, Grandmaster. Oh yes, Alexis, yes. Alexis Shiro's <laughs> legendary book. Yes, that. Um, yeah. So yeah, we're gonna try to insert that right here. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Hello, everybody. Today, I'm gonna perform a song called Fire on Board. One, two. Just a couple more things, Vishnu. So have you exposed her to chess? I tried to, but she says that she isn't as interested in chess as she is in these other things. So I've just let it be. So I, I tried using step uh, method, uh, the step uh, steps method. Um, she had a lot of fun making making up those mini games and she knows the moves. She can, you know, she can play a game of chess. Uh, she, I, I got her an account on chesskid.com. She has a friend who is really into chess, another six year old. But she somehow isn't isn't too interested in chess. But okay. you know that's okay. Yeah, she's young and that's okay. Yeah. Okay. And last question from supporter of the podcast. Thank you for the support to David Lazarus. And David says, um, "I feel like I've come upon my chess talent naturally." And I was wondering if you thought that I could have translated that into being musical and playing an instrument, even at my advanced age of sixty-four. Is it too late to try that? <laughs> Uh, thanks for the question, David. Um, not exactly sure what he means by saying he came upon his chess talent naturally. I assume it means that he was able to play chess at uh, the level that he wanted without a lot of effort. Um, now, in cognitive science, evidence for transfer of skill from one domain to another is actually sparse. Um, but that said, you don't really have to worry about all of these things. At the age of 64, there's nothing stopping you from trying a new skill. Uh, because like I said, I've given you examples earlier on in this interview about, you know, 65 plus year old uh, guys learning the rules of chess, getting to 1400 USCF, right? 
Um, there are, uh, so I, I can also give you an example of uh, my best friend who, uh, if you had listened to him sing at the age of 20, you would have thought that he was tone deaf. Um, however, uh, he did some training that I did as a kid. Um, he locked himself in a room for like three months and he uh, sang these tones for hours on end. And eventually he started singing backing vocals for me in our band. And he ended up going to Berkeley College of Music and he got a degree in jazz performance and composition. So uh, even with something like music where you would think that natural talent is so dominant, there are ways for you to train, right? At the age of 64, if you want to try and pick up an instrument, you know, just do it, you know? So, um, yeah, so I, I would just say you have one life here and you should do uh, what you want to try. And it doesn't matter if you fail at it as long as you enjoy the process. I think, uh, you know, all of us go through life uh, making memories and that's what we are left with eventually. And so if you try to pick up an instrument, you make music with your spouse, with your partner, with your friends, you know, make new memories. You know, that's that's all that matters in the uh, in the end, I think. Okay, yeah, good stuff. And um, and and um, I just I, one more question does occur to me because obviously you're moving in July. Is that right? Krishna? I'm moving earlier than that. I will move in May and I start in July. Wow. Yeah. Starting in July. OK. Yeah. Um, so how does how does that feel and what role will, will chess play in, in your life? Like what what's the map of your um, what will undoubtedly be like a, um, eventful next six months and beyond look like? Yeah, so in answering that question, it will probably be revealed to the uh, listeners here that I'm not a great guest for this podcast because chess is probably going to take a backseat uh, because my next job is going to be extremely demanding. It's probably 10 times the responsibility that I have currently as a postdoc uh, because I will be writing grants to fund my research. I will be uh, advising uh, students on their research. I will be teaching, uh, doing my own research, uh, administrative duties at the university. Uh, so as you can imagine, there's not going to be a lot of time left for chess or chess training. But if I can get an hour in every morning, uh, of let's say going over game collections, which is what I like to do. So, so I think I'm going to shift from an improvement mindset to uh, a purely enjoyment mindset when I go there. And that I think is going to be the healthiest way to do chess uh, going forward for me. Um, I'm, yeah. I, I might play in, in a tournament a year or so because it's so difficult to play a tournament in, in India given that they don't really have federated weekend tournaments. So you have to take a huge chunk out of your time to go play a tournament. So that sort of thing is going to be difficult. Yeah, well, it's disappointing to hear about Vishnu again, just like being sort of a casual online acquaintances with you in that time. There were there were periods where I wondered if like chess would stop you from getting a position like this. <laughs> so uh, congratulations. I am, I am glad. I mean, it's, it's quite an accomplishment. Obviously it's a extremely competitive field. Um, and, and I do know that, uh, that you have mentioned some chess research. So we're going to, we're as long as you're still online, we're going to try to hold your feet to the fire over that. <laughs> Not, you know, rush, but someday we want to get to the bottom of some of these, uh, cognitive chess questions that we've batted around. Yeah, I would love to answer these questions with more than a, you know, we don't know. So yeah, so I look forward to that. Excellent. Okay, anything else, Vishnu, before we uh, wrap it up? No, I think it's all great. Like I said, uh, it's been an honor, Ben. Uh, you know, it, it felt like chatting with a friend, even though we hadn't uh, talked before, uh, but just because we've been acquaintances over Twitter for such a long time. And the chess community on Twitter is a tightly bound community, I would say. So you know, all of you guys feel like real world friends to me. Uh, so it was great being on your uh, podcast. And thank you so much for having me. Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Vishnu. The feeling is mutual. Um, and good luck with your move. And uh, don't don't be a stranger. Right, thank you. Big shout out to Matthew Passy, my producer, been helping us for over four years. Much appreciated as always. I also would like to thank everyone who helped spread the word about the show, whether it be by word of mouth or a positive review on a podcast platform. I can't even keep track of all the platforms anymore. 
but every review is appreciated. I also wanted to remind you guys, you are always welcome to follow me or Perpetual Chess on social media. On Twitter, I'm at Beneficial1. That's where I'm most active. We also have the Perpetual Chess Facebook group where we post every episode and sometimes the guests chime in to continue the conversation. The Perpetual Chess Instagram page is unretired. Follow us at Perpetual Chess where we post weekly clips. If you would like to email me, the easiest way is ben at perpetualchesspod.com. Also, of course, want to thank our sponsors, chessable.com and Chess Aim and Chess Mood. Thanks for helping the cause, guys. Much appreciated and great products that I'm proud to be affiliated with. Last but not least, of course, I want to thank all of our Patreon and PayPal supporters. I would like to give extra special thanks to the following people and entities, chessable.com, David Lazarus of LazmanChess.com, Quality Chess Books, the Capital City Chess Club, the Abysmal Depths of Chess Blog, Adapta Interactive Web Designs and Services, the Apprentice Twitch Channel, Andrew Alharji, Andrew Bach, Anidi Deer, Austin Clough, Benjamin Porto, Bill Sigler, Kathy Carr, Chad Oliver, the Charlotte Chess Center, the Chess Central's Chess Blog, ChessMood.com, Chris Flanagan, Chris Lott, Dan O'Hanlon, Daniel He, Danny Davidson, David Schreiber, I am Dimitri Schneider, I am Eric Rosen, Eric Tam, Ewan Richardson, Farhan Thawar, Faraz Sawaf, Gary Foreman, Glenn Downing, Greg Harst, I am Greg Shahadi, Gregory Galuk, Guvin Manet, James Holyhead, James Kennedy, Jeff Martinson, Jens Green, Jeremy Nielsen, John Jernigan, John Rockefeller, John Cromarty, John MacArthur, Kelly Palmer, Kevin O'Callaghan, King Cell, The King's Crusher YouTube channel, one of the OGs of Chess YouTube, Lucio Casada Silva, The Law Offices of Stuart Katz, Matthew Feeney, Michael Can, FM Michael Oblin, Mike Zelazny, Mr. Mike Shahadi, the famous Mr. Dodgy, the Nerd Nays Twitch channel, Peter Sodi, the Playmore Chess Academy of the Hamden Chess Club, Reuven Fisher, Reverend Roy Fry, Seattle Chess Club, Shane Unger, Stefan Kelty, Stephen Martinez, Sven Gearson, Thomas Stanix, Thomas Tachenko, Todd Bryant of StrongChess.com, Todd Kennedy, The Vintage Patsers, which is a Chess.com improver group, Wayne Beam, William Hogarth, and I also would like to thank Aaron Waffler, Ace Viega, Adam Ralph of ChessEngland.com, Adrian Gutierrez, Alan and Maggie Sue, Alex Pejas, Alexander Markovitz, FM Andre Tarakov, Dr. Andrew Perry, Angus McLeod, Barry Hessian, Bill Juniper, Bill Moran, Brad and Andy Rosen, Brett Howard Lynn, Brian Chase, Brian Mullis, Bruce Scott, Brian Tillis of Palm Beach Chess, Chad Hilton, Chess Patser Spain, I'm not sure if that one's a real name, Dr. Charles Snodgrass, Chris Wainscott, Christopher Baumgartner, Christopher Shabri, Christopher Wood, I am Christoph Zalecki, aka Chess Explained, Coach Jay's Chess Academy, Corey Budson, Costa Caras, Courtney Fry, Craig Mallon, Daniel Ginsburg, Daniel Naylor, Dave Saylor, David Bleskoschek, David Brown, David Hamblin, David Cramley of Chessable.com, Dalen Shelton, Dennis Parrish, Dirk Durker, FM Donnie Ariel, Dwayne Edmonds, Ed Daly, Ed Mead, Emmanuel Langua Robitai, Ethan Smith, Hallelujah Cat, Ian Mason, Indrek Ryland, Felipe Melo Pereira, Fox Valley Chess Club, Francis Latart Lavoie, Dr. Frank Tortoris, Frank Zananis, Gary Andrews, Gary Lewis, Geert Vanderveld, Gene Stewart, Gerard Barta, Giovanni Russo, Han Schrute, Harish Srinivasan, Howard Vihan, Jacob Kovac, Jason Apollo, Jason Murray, Jacques Perry, James Aspinwall, James Bonastia, James Muir, Jason Woolham, J.D. Chakrabarty, Jeff Anderson, Jeffrey Martello, Yep Hoyland, Jerry Wells, Jim Ratliff, Joe Valdez, Joel Thomas Ramos, John Tully, Juan Almagar, Dr. John Fallon, John Fernandez, John Fontaine, John Hartman, Jeff Jeffrey, John McMurtry, Jonathan Slater, John Quist, John Tully, Jose Rodriguez, Justin Gardner, Jen Shahadi, Joe Rocky, John Thompson, Josh Fridell, Kare Christensen, WGM, Katarina Nemsova, Kelly Palmer, Kevin Pryor, Kior Gata of the Lakeshore Chess Club, I am Kostya Kovutsky of the Chess Dojo, Krishna Gopala Krishnan, Kyle McAvoy, Larry Cook, Larry Ryforth, Laura Boyovsky, Macaulay Peterson, Mark Fitzpatrick, Mark Miller, Martin Knudsen, Martin Krug, Matthew Passy, Matthew Tedesco, Matthias Plock, Mechanics Institute of San Francisco, Michael Allard, Michael Hudson, Mike Clem, Mitchell Fabian, Nate Gabel, Nate Solon, 
Neil Bruce, Negma Malajanov, Nicholas Isabel, Olaf Mueller Michaels, GM Pascal Charbonneau, Passy Passanen, Paul Bain, Paul Clarkson, Paul Sweeney, Paulo Santana, Peter Lux, Randy Temple, Ricky Grijalva, Richard Hallenbach, Robert Tichi, Robert Turner, Rory Coleman, Rory Yearwood, Ryan Berg, the Say Chess YouTube channel, Scott Doherty, Scott McKinnon, Sebastian Finsterwater, Seth Ruzica, Shane Unger, Silver Knights in Richmond, Stefan Roller, WGM Tati of Abrahamian, Tim Brennan of TacticsTime.com, Tim Seymour, Timothy Ha, Tom Edsel, Tomas Komanic, Tony Rotella, Tyron Price, Vishnu Srikumar, William Brock, William Peterson, FM Zhao Cheng of Chess1000.com, and Zhivko Stoyanov. Thanks, as always, for the support, everyone. I will catch you guys all next week.